for large enterprises, it will find a set of co-elevating coaches in the room that will allow you to accelerate innovation, boldness, extraordinary. And these are the attributes, which you know, I get into in more detail, and the data that we have. What I've loved is the rigor that I've been able to bring to our organization. I, I sell our research not as an output, but as an input. I'll go to a company like Google and say, collectively, we should research the future of hybrid work, or collectively, we should research how AI is going to impact team efficacy. And then they will fund my research as a co-creation because they're committed to the, they're, they're, they're co-elevating with me. And it's a beautiful model because I'm a small firm, but it allows us to have, you know, I'll take a topic and we'll get two to $5 million of investment from large brands to co-create the cracking the code of that. And with that, I've been able to bring in a community of extraordinary thought leaders. So our data is extraordinary and it ends up being a profit center for us at the same time. Right? And that's something that you know, I'm, I'm really focused on right now is this sense of shared partnership and research institute. And it allowed us in literally less than two years during the pandemic to do the largest data set of 2,000 teams and how they were reinventing work during the pandemic that created this book, um, Competing in the New World of Work. It was published by Harvard. Now, I've spent a lot of time. Let me give you a little thumbnail before I end with a story that I think is meaningful. This is a model that we created because I believe, if you look back, we're now in the third wave of the reinvention of work. The 70s opened our eyes to the importance of total quality management. By the way, not created by HR, but created by manufacturing out of necessity for quality improvement. The next wave was agile. Agile was created by necessity by engineering organizations. And the reality is that every one of our organizations today needs to operate under an agile operating system. Not just project management, not just operations. Every company needs to be operating on agile from top to bottom. And I'm writing about one of my clients, IBM. Arvind, the CEO, uses agile from the very top of the organization. Why? Because he was born in engineering. And it's allowing them to outstrip other organizations' success in their segments. Um, but, and this includes AI, et cetera, but here's what's coming down the pike. What's happening right now is world-class digital reinvention of work in a digital format has not actually happened. What you did during the pandemic is we just, you changed where you worked, not how. You took your boardroom meetings and you moved them into Zoom, and now you've moved them back in the boardroom. We're focusing on policy, because that's what HR does, not practices and process. We're, the world-class hybrid teams were born and suckled on the Google stack in, at Stanford. These are kids that started their businesses out of Stanford, unicorn, fast growth companies, and they don't collaborate in meetings. Meetings are not the primary form of collaboration. There's an entire digital way of collaborating that most organizations, in fact, only 15% of companies are in levels four or five. We're at a level of, or, right, I'm sorry, level four and five. 85% of organizations are struggling down at one and two. We're right now on the cusp of the reinvention of work, of white collar work, and people don't even, aren't even curious enough. We're still battling whether we should be two or five days in the office. <laughs> so this is where my heart is right now. And it's a new wave of what I started when I was a kid looking at TQM. Now, let me, um, I loved that uh, Austin had this. I wasn't going to do this, but this allow, I will send you, some, there's a couple of articles my team have teed up around the, the hybrid ways of work that we've written in um, just recently in Forbes and in Harvard Business Review. Um, this also offers um, to take a diagnostic test for high performing teams that we've created. And it also asks if you want a conversation with one of our people, which I don't expect to be a commercial thing. But if you, know, if you want to engage with me, you can do that through this. Because who knows, out of here, I might find new partner opportunities to, to work with and, and co-create with. Um, let me end with this. So that's my mom. Right after Never Loan came out, I was out on the speaker circuit a lot. And my mom called me and she said, Keith, 
I was watching you on the YouTube, <laughs> and I noticed something. You talk a lot about your dad. <laughs> and I said, oh, uh, I said, um, I'm sorry. Um, that's right. But I'm writing a book right now um, about peer groups that don't let each other fail. And mom, I remember something growing up that maybe you can help me with. And that something was, my mom had a group of ladies that um, used to meet at our house uh, once every couple of months. And I asked mom, I said, tell me about that group of ladies. What, how meaningful was that group? She said, oh, you mean the card club girls. So the card club girls, I found out, have been having, playing cards every month for um, 55 years. They had never once skipped a card playing. And then they would just rotate. So when, they, when it was time for my mom to host, the only thing I knew was that dad and I were kicked out of the house, <laughs> which was cool for dad and I, but I had no idea what was going on. So mom, mom, would, mom would sit there with these ladies playing cards. And I said, mom, how meaningful was that group to you? And she said, well, when your aunt died, we, um, we didn't cancel the card game three days before she passed. We went to her bedside, and we sat on her bed. And she said, she was still conscious, she said she didn't want to cancel the card game. She wanted to play cards one last time with the girls. When your dad was unemployed, those ladies cooked extra every day. And when your, your dad was out looking for work, I'd call them and they would slip down and give us the food so that dad wouldn't think we were taking charity, but he'd think we were able to stretch a nickel. Because back then, unemployment insurance had run out. We had no money. And the government was only offering, at that point, something called welfare cheese. And we, she said, we didn't have to eat welfare cheese. And she said, uh, when your dad died, the girls made sure that I got out of the house every day for months until I was ready to get out of the house myself. Um, there's only three of them left now. My mom's crushing it at 90, by the way. <laughs> um, she says that, she jokes, she says, every time one of us dies, we have to, play the, we have to change the card game. <laughs> She says, one of these days, there'll be one of us sitting there playing solitaire, thinking about the others. I was, when I wrote this book, the first thing, I was so relieved living on the other side of the country from Pittsburgh. I was so relieved that my mom had this. And all my life, she's had this. She's had a group that has had her back all her life. And then at the time that I was writing this book, I realized I didn't. It was at the time when I was in a relationship that wasn't the love of my life. It was a time that um, I wasn't being the leader that anywhere could create this kind of an ethos in the workplace. That was a while ago, and it was a long journey. And I have to say that the journey is, you know, I wish that I could say all the stuff, the formula, the stuff I've been giving you. What was going through my head today for you was, OK, what was my mission when? What was my mission when? You know, what had I achieved using the tools that I had? And how could I communicate those tools to you for your benefit? What was I really struggling with? And not just the business tools, but what were the life tools, my seeker tools, that I was using to get myself ready for the next level that I could then bring to the world? That's was, that was my thinking about this talk as I was conceiving it for you. Um, and in one regard, the scarcity of me feels exhausted. <laughs> like, fuck, been working so hard to catch up to the person I'd like to someday be, you know? Um, 
That's the scarcity mind. Remember I said my big job right now is acceptance? The acceptance of I'm already there, right? Um, that one would say, what a blessing. When I wrote Never Eat Alone, I could not have done what I'm doing right now for you, with you. We're co-creating this for sure. Um, I couldn't have, I would have been up here trying to impress. I bet there was still some of that in this talk too. Um, but it, that's okay, right? It's okay that I can still recognize my crazy head and that it's all good. So going forward, it's about acceptance. Probably the most powerful tool that I could use going forward is love. And probably the biggest thing that I've got to crack the code of now is partnership, right? Just learning those muscles on partnership and trust um, that will create the biggest footprint. I always used to think that God put us on this planet to maximize. I'm a maximizer, definitely. Um, activator, maximizer. And God put us on this planet to make the biggest footprint possible by the time we move out of this planet. And I'm sure some of that's beautifully healthy and some of, some of that's beautiful scarcity. But my big footprint will probably come with a lighter ripple. And it might make a bigger impact. And I'm just still on the edge of learning that. Thank you. <laughs>